How's your faith this morning? Holding on. That's the main thing. We must hold on, right? Before we continue, let's bow our heads. Our gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, again for the opportunity that we have to open your word to consider things of great import. And Lord, I just pray for your spirit to be present. I need your spirit to speak through me, and we all need your spirit to speak in and through us. And Father, I just ask that you will have your way with us, that we will be attentive to what you have to say, and that we will truly, not just here in church, but we will truly worship you every moment of every day of our lives that we have left. And we thank you for being here, for we pray this in Jesus' strong name, amen. It gets pretty foggy in Newfoundland at times, doesn't it? And I remember a, a particularly bad time of fog. And it so happened that the time I'm referring to was I was actually living here in Bay Roberts. I remember when it started. I remember when it ended three weeks later. And I remember what I went through, especially by the time the third week came. I was pretty much a basket case. And we're not talking fog off in the distance, offshore. This was really dense, pea soup type fog. And the wind was northern, and it was chilly. It was mid-October when it started, and it ended at the end of the first week of November. And I was getting pretty bad. It was gloomy and chilly. It was dark. And I was starting to feel dark. I was pressed down. Anybody relate? I think some people, some people are nodding their heads. Maybe some of you like being in the fog. I'm not sure. I don't like fog except for short periods of time. This particular afternoon, I even know where I was. It had a massive impact on me. I was, I was down in Bay Roberts East somewhere. I'm not sure exactly, but I was on my way back. And I got to the lights here. They are by Powell's. And I stopped at the light. And of course, I'm facing basically west-southwest. It was right after lunch. And all of a sudden, the sun broke through the fog. Well, I believe I cried and everything. I, was, I almost jumped out. I could see why some people engage in sun worship. I was nearly gone. And I wanted, that's how I felt. I was probably shouting in the car. Yeah, I don't remember that part. Because I do a lot of strange things when I'm driving. Even by myself. But the joy... And the, the lift, the burden that came off of my shoulders and my old mind and everything, my personality was changing. I was becoming difficult to live with. Fogged in. And I'm going to relate another in incident. Last January. Anybody remember the big wind we had last January? And they had a big blizzard in St. John's at the same time. We didn't get the snow where I lived, but we certainly got the wind. The most wind I have ever seen at the Cape. And we get some pretty windy times. And I remember, of course, with all that wind, the gusts up to 160, 
With all that wind in an exposed area, of course, the power went out. And living in a house with no wood stove, only electric heat, it gets cold pretty quick in January. And I decided that I was going to leave the house at that particular moment I was there by myself. I decided I was going to go into a friend's place because they had a wood stove. And I wanted a little bit of warmth. And I was scared to death. No. <laughs> it was so bad. Everything was shaking. I thought everything was coming off the side of the house, like the siding. So I, I decided, and this was pitch black now. Of course, no street lights. Cape Frills does have street lights, just to let you know. We have a lot for a small place. Because we're all afraid. <laughs> but... Um, I decided I was going to go in the road, only about less than a mile. So I, get, I went out and got the truck started, went back in the house, and the truck was parked on the side of the house that was in sheltered from the wind. So I go back out, I get in the truck, and then I came out away from the shelter of the house, and I thought I was gone. The wind, well, the wind was kind of, well, north, northeast. It hit the side of the truck. The truck was shaking. I couldn't see anything because there wasn't enough snow to be blowing around. I managed to get around and go in the road. I got, well, I only got about two or 300 yards. Came to a little fort in the road there in the Cape. I had to stop. I couldn't see anything because that was a place where it was drifting a bit. And I just sat there. Then I was trying to decide, should I keep going, I wonder, or should I go back? I had never seen it so black. Well, the only thing, even the likes of the truck was barely penetrated. I don't know what, it was, it was a weird time. The truck was rocking in the wind. And I, I tried to, de I had to decide, am I going on or should I turn around? Because I knew if I go off the road, I couldn't see very much. If I go off the road going in here, I'll probably never get back to the house. That's how it was really wild, and I felt a bit uneasy. So I decided, I think I'll go on. And I still couldn't see anything. It's a straight road, perfectly straight road, and I still couldn't see a thing. So I put the window down. Luckily, the wind was on the other side of the truck, so I, could, I put the window down. All I could see was the, a little bit of snow on the shoulder of the road. So I followed along the edge of that, took my time, Black. Oh, my. It was so black. Uh, I'll never forget it. It was the weirdest feeling because I always used to go out in storms when I was younger. I'd dress up and go out in a blizzard because I'm one of those people, you know, a bit different. And I enjoyed that, but I was not very pleased with this one. But I made it to the house where my friends were, and I got inside, and the fire was going. And they had little lights here and there. And the darkness was dispelled. And it's the same. How wonderful it is when the darkness is lifted. Isn't it though? And when you're I'm, uh, back to the fog for a second. I remember as a young person, I, I pride myself on having a good sense of direction. Until you put me in fog. I remember being out in boat in fog, and whoever was uh, probably my father at the time, because I was only young, and the boat would be going the direction he wanted to go, according to the compass. The compass was true, and I was sitting in the, in the boat thinking, this is not right. We are not going southwest, we're going northeast. Fog is very disorientating. You would, you would convince yourself, unless you have a compass or something, you would, it's very easy to get off course when the fog is dense. But how beautiful, how beautiful when the fog and the darkness disappears. Darkness. There's a lot of darkness 
in our world, isn't there? There's a lot of darkness in people's minds, in people's souls. The world's lights, true lights, are few, I would suggest. The Bible refers to a gross darkness that covers the earth and darkness covering the people, the ancient prophet Isaiah. And sometimes, if we're honest, and I don't mind being honest, there's an absence of light in our own minds, in our own hearts. Have you ever felt the darkness yourself? I have. More times than I would like to remember. And of course, there's the Prince of Darkness Grimm, to use Martin Luther's words. Satan himself, referred to as the Prince of Darkness. Isn't that interesting? The absence of the light. And you know, we have this going on sometimes, and something in me, something in you cries out for light. We need light. And I, I'd like to read the words of a poem here that I really like. I've read it before, probably read it here. I think I have, actually. And it's by John Henry. Yeah, that's his name, John Henry. John Henry Newman. And he wrote this in 1833. He was a young Roman Catholic priest. And the circumstances of the writing, sometimes it's good to know why they wrote what they wrote. He was, uh, he was based in England. But he had gone to Italy for something. It, doesn't, it didn't say why he went to Italy. But while he was in Italy, he became really quite sick. And he was really sick. He was not an older man. He was quite young. And he was quite sick for about three weeks. And his sickness really got to him. The darkness descended over him in his sickness. And finally, after about three weeks or so, he was able to, he got a lot better, and he was able to travel, but he still had trouble getting a voyage, because he had to go by boat. He was having trouble getting a boat, and they finally managed to get a berth on a boat that, that was shipping oranges, of all things, over to England. And... While on the way, he says we got his own words, we got becalmed, meaning there was no wind, because they used sailboats. And they sat there in a little place not far from shore for over a week, and they couldn't move. It wasn't foggy, but there was no wind at all. And of course, he's really missing the people that he served in England. So he writes this poem. Lead kindly light. Lead kindly light amid the encircling gloom. Lead thou me on. The night is dark and I am far from home. Lead thou me on. Keep thou my feet. I do not ask to see the distant scene. One step enough for me. I was not ever thus, nor prayed that thou shouldest lead me on. And how many of us are the same sometimes? I love to choose and see my path, but now lead thou me on. I love the garish day, that means the bright day. And in spite of fears, pride ruled my will. Remember not past years. So long thy power has blessed me. Sure, it still will lead me on. Or moor and fen, or crag and torrent, till the night is gone. And with the morn, those angel faces smile, which I have loved long since and lost a while. Sounds like he's really lonely and missing a lot of people. And he's looking forward so much to getting back to his flock, if you if to use it that way, you can use to use that terminology. His people he served. 
Matthew 4, I'm going to, it's five or six texts here. I'm going to quote them. You don't have to turn to them, but you will have to turn to a passage here in a little bit. Matthew 4, 16, talking about light and darkness. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. Have you seen a great light? And how beautiful it is. Like when I saw the sun after three weeks of dense fog, that was a beautiful, beautiful thing. And of course, in context, this is talking about the light of Christ's arrival on the earth. His first arrival. John 1.5, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Can you imagine? Imagine for a minute if there was no light that could dispel the darkness. Where would we be? Imagine trying to go somewhere without a light source. Oh my. John 8.12, Jesus declares emphatically, I am the light. Whoever follows me, whoever follows me will not walk or live in darkness. Is that heavy? Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. And I asked a question, as I mentioned before, yet I have often found myself in darkness. More about that later. 1 Peter 2.9, talking about all of God's people. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. The Bible is full of this, this dual, dualism. Really. It's, it's sort of a play and counterplay between light and darkness. It's all through scripture. It starts in right in the first chapter of Genesis. And darkness was over the face of the deep. And God said, let there be light. And you know what? He's still saying it. In the darkness, God can speak light into any dark situation. And I'm, I, for one, am really, really glad that he can We're going to take a closer look at a chapter in Scripture that one of the ancient prophets, the one that actually we're studying at this moment, Isaiah. But it's a lot further over in Isaiah. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 59. Isaiah's book, the book of Isaiah, is a very powerful, they call him the gospel prophet, and for good reason. There's such beauty in this book. In spite of the historical emphasis in some sections, there's a lot in this book about salvation. In fact, the name Isaiah means that God is Savior. So, it's not surprising. We're starting at verse 9. And see if this doesn't sound similar to what we may experience or what's in our world. Therefore, justice is far from us, nor does righteousness overtake us. We look, we look for light, but there is darkness. For brightness, but we walk in blackness. Anybody relate to this? Listen to the news for a while. You want some blackness and darkness and downright weird? Listen to the news and listen to, and sometimes in my own heart, I find myself, I'm looking for light, but I can't seem to see clearly. Anybody with me? I just can't seem to see through the fog. It's just coming in. And sometimes, sometimes you hear the forecast, fog retreating to the coast. But if you live on the coast, you're still in the fog. you got to go inland. 
And sometimes I get in my truck and I drive inland so I can see the sun. I can't deal with it. Fog retreating to the coast, but many of us are still on the coast and we're living in the fog. We want the light, but we can't seem to, can't seem to get there. Look at the next verse. We grope for the wall like the blind, and we grope as if we had no eyes. Oh, I love the way the Bible is written. There's a lot of power in the way Scripture is written. We stumble at noonday as at twilight. You ever stumble at noonday? Sometimes there's an excess of light. We got so much light. You know how a bright light can blind you? And you still can't see? Sometimes we're stumbling for an, because of an excess of light. We are as dead men in desolate places. Doesn't sound very good, does it? Look at the next verse. We all growl like bears and moan sadly like doves. <laughs> oh my. When I read that, uh, the other day, just for the first time, to that it struck me, we we growl like bears and moan like doves. And you know what? That is so easy to do when you're in the in a dark place, isn't it? People are growling; they can't take very much. They're, they're, they can get downright nasty, and people are moaning and groaning and complaining and whining. And some of it is legitimate, and some of it isn't. But we're not in the light. And we don't know what to do with ourselves. We look for justice, it goes on. But there is none for salvation. But it is far from us. And we, asked ourselves, we have to ask ourselves the question, why is it like this? Why is the darkness there? And Isaiah brings out one reason. This is not the only reason. Sometimes darkness just comes. It is not even explainable at all. No reason can be given. It just seems to come out of nowhere. Boy, I don't feel very, I don't feel like it's very much light in me today. You ever feel like that? You get up some mornings and you can't get out of your own way. Am I the only one? Sometimes I want to crawl back into bed. Actually, that's not true as I hate being in bed too long. But you know what I'm trying to say. You don't want to face the world. You don't want to face people. You don't want to face situations. You just want to, to go somewhere by yourself because you're not fit. You're not fit. It feels dark. And you're, it's just not, something is not right. And you wonder, where did this come from? And you can't find the reason. And, and sometimes we might be what some writers call the shade of God's hand. Is this a darkness that is not explainable and it's just there, but God is not gone? God is never gone, you know. Just remember that God doesn't run away as if he can't stand us or something like that. And in verses 12 and 13, this is one reason why darkness and fog can come over our lives. It says, for our transgressions are multiplied before you, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us, and as for our iniquities, we know them. Uh-oh. In transgressing and lying against the Lord and departing from our God, we may speak oppression, and we may utter false words or have false things in our hearts. If we are deliberately separating or departing from God and we know we're doing it you can rest assured the fog is going to roll in I know I know it's happened to me many times and the darkness will descend if we deliberately violate something the Lord has shown us the light if God gives me light what should I do with the light if someone shines a light along my say I'm lost and a beam comes from somewhere and comes across through the woods and shows me a pathway and I'm lost, what should I do? I should follow, yeah, where the light is shining, follow the pathway 
out and not be lost, to be found. If God gives me light, whatever that light might be, and he himself is the light, and I deliberately turn away from it, what would I expect other than darkness? How could it be otherwise? It can't be otherwise. And if I'm speaking lies, I am separating myself from God and I feel this mist coming around me. And if I'm, if I'm oh, there's many things that can, can, can bring the fog in. If I look at my sister in Jesus or my brother in Jesus and I'm analyzing him minutely and all I can see is his many faults, guess what happens to me? The fog descends. And the fog comes in. It comes in and it moves silently. And it just sits there like a cat sitting on some perch. And it just kind of, it's just there. And it's quiet. But I'm absent the light. Oh my. Groping around. Groping around in the fog and the mist when I don't need to. Now, doesn't sound like a very good idea, does it? I don't think so. Look at verse 14. Now, if this doesn't describe the world we live in, I don't know what does. I've always liked this text. Verses 14 and 15. Justice is turned back, and righteousness stands afar off or far away. And equity cannot enter. So truth fails, and he who departs from evil makes himself or herself a prey. Is it, doesn't that describe the world we live in today? Justice. Where is justice? Where is equity and fairness? Where is truth? It says it's standing afar off. Where is true righteousness being lived out in this world that we live in? At every level. You think governments are acting righteously? Look at the way things are moving. Look at corporations. Look at every sector of society. And tell me if you think that it's just and equitable and truthful, etc., etc. It's not. It just isn't. There are exceptions, but they're few. These are very sad times, and these are hard times. And I like the next part of verse 15, and I say, praise the Lord. And some people don't know to deal with God and his justice, and I don't understand because I've never personally had an issue with God being just because God's justice is based on his love. If God is not going to take care of injustice, who's going to do it? Tell me that. Is, are people going to do it? On, on, in a grand way, in a big way? Are we going to take care of all the injustice? If God doesn't step in and remove the injustice, who's going to do it? And he does it because he's a loving God. Otherwise, we would always have it. It says, Then the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. Isn't that amazing? He saw that there was no person and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, God knew nobody could take care of the situation Therefore, his own arm brought salvation for him, and his own righteousness, it sustained him. And we could say amen. Verse 17, for he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation. It sounds like what we're told to do in Ephesians. And a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. Boy, and here's what the verse people don't like. According to their deeds, accordingly he will repay. 
fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies, and people go, well. <laughs> Again, I ask, if God is not going to take care of the problem, who is? The devil loves injustice, and he would like to keep it that way. He would love to see oppression. He would love to see distortion and lies. He would love to see truth pushed down and trampled on. He would love to see a world with no real righteousness, wouldn't he? If God doesn't intervene, we're, all, we're going to be here forevermore. I don't want to be here forevermore because I don't think the fog is going to lift for good. It keeps coming back. It says, They shall fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. Yeah, I like that. From the rising of the sun, when the sun rises, here comes the light. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. Whatever enemy comes against you and me, and Satan is the prime enemy, and he uses whatever he can, the Lord himself will lift up a standard. Can you say amen? If there's no standard that God lifts up, where are we going to be? I don't know what I would do. Personally, I wouldn't be here, actually. The Redeemer will come to Zion. And after we say all of this, and before I forget, Jesus said, if the light that's in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Boy, that's a heavy text, isn't it? If the light that's in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? And that's why it's so important that as God shows us himself and reveals things to us, that we fall into line and get in stride with God and stay there and stay in the light. Stay in the light and more light will shine because no, God never stops revealing himself, does he? We will always learn more of God and the light will even brighten. So on the basis of all that God is doing, and as done, look at chapter 60, verses 1 and 2. Arise and shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But, thank God for the buts, the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. Do you want God's glory on your life. I want God's glory in on my life. I want God to shine on me and I want his glory to be seen. God is being robbed of his glory in our world. Isn't he? He doesn't get credit for what he has done. Every nature program that I look at, every all the credit goes to mother nature. And father God is left out. Is the weirdest thing. And, and I, I think to myself, all the beauty in God's creation, and he never gets a mention. He's being robbed of his glory. The light is shining, and people are walking in the darkness. And I find it so very, very, very sad. And lastly... Verses 19 and 20 in the same chapter. Look at this. And you're going to say, oh, I've seen this somewhere else. Yes, you have. The last book of the Bible, actually. Because a lot of the verses in, a lot of the texts in Revelation are actually taken out of Isaiah. It's, it's astonishing. Look at verses 19 and 20. The sun shall no longer be your light by day, nor the brightness nor for brightness shall the moon give light to you, but the Lord will be to you an everlasting light, and your God your glory. Your sun shall no longer go down, nor shall your moon withdraw itself, for the Lord will be your everlasting light, and, they, and the days of your mourning shall be ended. 
And if you go to Revelation 21, 23, it talks about in the holy city, there's no need of the light of the moon and the sun because the glory of the Lord is in the city and it's more powerful than any natural light. The darkness is dispelled once, once and for all. I don't know about you, but I don't want to walk in darkness all the time. Um, God is, God is uh, sometimes I sit back in the quiet and I think about the great privilege I have had in my life and the light that the Lord has been pleased to cast across my pathway and I'm astonished. I'm truly amazed at, the, at how much God has shown me about himself, how much he's revealed to me from his word, how much he's taught me through other people who walk with him. And I, I don't know what to say. And I, I, I sometimes had to say him, Lord, forgive me for choosing to walk at all in darkness. And you know, we should rejoice. And I'm going to close with a poem here. Or is, yeah, it's a poem. It's not really been put to a hymn. But uh, this one was written by a guy named John Greenleaf, beautiful name, John Greenleaf Whittier. And the name of the poem is Laus Deo, which is Latin, of course, and it means praise be to God. He wrote this in 1865, and he wrote it as to rejoice after the abolition of slavery. Talk about injustice. And he gave God the credit for ending the oppression of people. And don't think there's not lots of slavery in our world today. And exploitation, I could go on and on. And many need to see the light. Now this is written, some of this is a little bit older English, but who cares? It's beautiful. And here it is. It is done. Clang of bell and roar of guns send the tidings up and down. How the, how the belfries rock and reel, how the great guns peel on peel, fling the joy from town to town. He's describing the joy that was going on at the time. Ring, O bells. Every stroke exalting tells of the burial hour of crime. Loud and long that all may hear, ring for every listening ear of eternity and time. Some of you don't like poetry, but I love it. Let us kneel. God's own voice is in that peal, and this spot is holy ground. Lord, forgive us. What are we that our eyes this glory see, that our hearts have heard this sound? Oh, it's beautiful. For the Lord on the whirlwind is abroad. In the earthquake he has spoken. He is smitten, smitten with his thunder, the iron walls asunder, and the gates of brass are broken. This is, this is lofty language, but it's a lofty concept. Language cannot describe the glory of God. This is a feeble attempt by a man, and he's done a good job. Loud and long, lift the old exulting song, Sing with Miriam by the sea. He has cast the mighty down. Horse and rider sink and drown. He hath triumphed gloriously. Did we dare in our agony of prayer ask for more than he has done? When was ever his right hand over any time or land stretched as now beneath the sun? How they pale, ancient myth and song and tale. In this wonder of our days, when the cruel rod of war blossoms white with righteous law, and the wrath of man is praise. I like that little reference there to the blossoming of the rod. And we know where that comes from. Blotted out, all within and all about, shall a fresher life begin. Freer breathe the universe as it rolls its heavy curse on the dead and buried sin. Do you know what? If we understood 
if we understood, if I understood the glory of God, the graciousness of God in forgiving me of my personal sins, I would be running out the door shouting, glory to God, praise his holy name. It's a miracle. It is done. In the circuit of the sun shall the sound thereof go forth. It shall bid the sad rejoice. It shall give the dumb a voice. It shall belt with joy the earth. Ring and swing bells of joy. On morning's wing send the song of praise abroad. With a sound of broken chains tell the nations that he reigns. Who alone is Lord and God. Oh, my. And the congregation said, Amen. That's beautiful. Beautiful. Look it up. Memorize it. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you that Jesus came here and said these astonishing words, I am the light of the world. And we thank you that the light is shone in darkness and the darkness cannot contain the light. And despite, oh God, everything, and despite the fogs that roll in in the darkest night, you are still there and your light will penetrate and you will take care of all of this, O oh God, and your justice will reign. And we thank you so much and we pray this in Jesus' name and we give you the glory. Amen.